church and today over 2,000 years later we're still standing on the
You know, we all are going to face death unless the Lord returns. And I love this song because it says, when I travel my last mile, he's going to be waiting for me. I guess George Beverly Shea made the song great, How Great Thou Art, but what a testimony to the, to the great power and the glory and the power of our Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. Amen.
last song. We want you to help us. It's not in your hymnals, but I believe everybody knows that song. What a day that will be. That's what we've been singing about, isn't it? We invite you to stand with us and sing. If you don't know the words, just grin and praise him, okay? What a day. Every voice, every voice. Here we go. There is coming a day when the heart aches to come. No more clouds in the sky. No more tears to dim the eyes. All is peace forevermore on that happy golden shore. What a day, glorious day that will Here we go, here we go.
<laughs> Amen. What a day. I hope you got everything in order. You know, he said, be ye ready in such an hour as you think not. He said, don't get ready, be ready. Be ready, be looking. How great thou art. Uh, Lord's willing, tomorrow evening we'll be back in our regular service. It's here at Oakland at 630. And then Brother Raph will be back on Thursday night. But he can't be here Friday night. I tell you why, and this is, I made the vote. He said, this is my situation. I got home and forgot it was my wife's birthday. <laughs> if you've been to Korea with us, you know what that means. <laughs> me forgive you, me forgive you. But uh, we'll be back on Thursday night, and, uh, and uh, I tell you, I uh, just pray that God's given us some heavenly juratol for the days that lie ahead. And uh, we've been teaching on Wednesday night how to make it through difficult times in Exodus chapter 14. Our study tomorrow night is the presence of God that is with you. How great thou art. Who's with you? Genesis 1.1, 1, 1, he's God. Genesis 4, he's the mighty God. Genesis 17, he's the everlasting God. Exodus chapter 4, uh, 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 3 and verse 14, he's the great I am. And you go, when you understand who's with you, you won't be biting your fingernails off up to your elbows worrying about everything. Amen? Realize he's got it all in control. Okay? But so good to welcome you tonight, and may God richly bless you. And uh, then Sunday, this Lord's Day, we'll be continue preaching on the cross. We've been preaching for the last several Sundays on the cross. Praise God. Just Sunday morning, message entitled Calvary. Calvary. And let's just pray God to continue to move and bless, okay? Now, let's see if you can get as excited as you've been over the singing when we take an offering, okay? Huh? Woo! Glory. I mean, really excited now. I mean, just give. I, I'm going to tell you, I believe the, the spirit of giving is an experience, one of the greatest things you can do in your Christian life. And I want you to give to God's man tonight. And uh, I, if, you'll, if you'll stop and think all the ministries that this man heads up, all the things that he does, I don't see how he does. I honestly do not see. Went home last night, uh, death, pastor, pastor's a large church and all, but yet all the other ministries that he does. Don't you want to have him? How'd you like to take a little burden off of him and not have to worry about the finances? I do have my hearing aids in, don't I? Now you going down there and give? You say, if you shut up, I will. Let's come on, ushers, okay? What an honor it is tonight to have my good friend, Dr. Ronnie Owens. How many of you have listened to Howard Graham broadcast? Man, he shells the corn every once in a while, don't he? Whew, glory. How about praying for us tonight, Brother Ronnie? Yes. Amen. Amen.
old Seth put a CD together, and I got to listen to the first one, and I can't sing, but I drove down the road, and I started singing. <laughs> Amen. Glory to God, I tell you. I, just rem I was just reminded tonight how bad I sing. I stood by Brother Ronnie Owens tonight. <laughs> I said, Lord, I sound good. <laughs> oh, Lordy. Sister April is going to come and sing a special tonight before Brother Ralph comes. Sister April, you come on. Amen. Amen. Don't you get up here and tell no tales now. I could sure tell a few, but I won't. <laughs> um, I'd like to thank God for his many blessings that he's uh, blessed me with in this life. He's been so good to me, and uh, I can sit here all day and all night and tell you every, about every one of them and still not tell you enough, and uh, he's just been so good to me, and I thank him for the opportunity that he can just maybe use me in any little way, shape, or form. And I thank you for that tonight. So listen to the words of this song. <clears throat> when he moves among us, all that he does, all of his mercy and all of his love if the pen of a writer could write every day even this world could never contain how i've been blessed the one thing the winter the flowers in spring, laughter of summer, and the changing of leaves, food on my table, and a good place to sleep, clothes on my back, and shoes on my feet, I have been. got to praise him as long as I breathe I have been blessed a father and mother who nurtured and raised brothers and sisters and the memories we made our pastor to lead us this all that still heal and the blood that still saves I have been blessed I have been blessed God's so good to me precious are his thoughts of you and me no way I could count them there's no Oh 
you that was wonderful and thank you pastor Roy for the invitation to be here tonight and we are looking forward to Thursday night a lot of people were asking would I deal with maybe some prophecy and talk about some things that are happening in the Middle East we had a couple of phone calls from Jerusalem this morning and we know that the world is changing and you always have to remember God doesn't tell time with a clock or a calendar. God tells time with the nation of Israel. And if God's dealing with Israel, then the prophetic clock is counting down. So uh, we will try to do that by the help of the Lord. Israel has a new weapon system. Uh, you know the Iron Dome, we've talked about that. And uh, Raphael Technologies gave us permission uh, to put together the video that we have. It shows how all of those systems link together. And each one of them have a biblical name out of Ezekiel 38 and 39. That's fascinating to me uh, that what is happening. And the brand new weapon system online uh, that just went into place called Locus. And so you think about all that's happening. So the Lord willing, on Thursday evening, we will try to do that by the help of the Lord. Some of you ask about going over uh, with us in November. This will be our 50th teaching tour into the Holy Land, November the 8th. And so uh, if you are interested, see Pastor Roy, and he's going to be traveling with us. And any of you other pastors that want to uh, bring a group from your church, we'll make sure that happens as well. I appreciate uh, Colby and uh, Carter being with us, uh, coming over tonight and uh, uh, last night. And on the way home last night, uh, uh, Carter's grandfather passed away while he was coming back from the service. And so that's where he is tonight. And uh, Cody is here tonight uh, and uh, Colby. And we appreciate them being here these young men love the Lord, and you think about young men getting off work, out of school, yes. and driving uh, to be with their preacher. Isn't that a blessing? Amen. And, um, and so we, lo we love the Lord, and, and I know the Lord loves them for that service. I want you to take your Bible tonight, and I'm going to ask uh, for your prayers, especially this evening. 
I had the privilege of uh, having dinner with uh, Pastor Ronnie, and uh, I tried to pick his brain, all, the, all this brain trust that he's uh, got going on there. There's so much in the Word of God, and I can honestly tell you there's never been a more exciting time to be a student of the book. Amen. This Amen. Is, it's, it's just unbelievable. Yes, and if you go to the Holy Land and you come back, then it's just like a pop-up book, one of these little kids' books. You open it up, and it pops up because yeah. you see it come alive. Yeah. But uh, I'm going to ask for your prayers tonight because I want to deal with a difficult subject. It has to do, uh, it's not really what we would call a revival or a camp meeting message. It's more a time of study and growth for the family of faith. And I think if there's anything we need to do right now, we do need to grow up. Amen. We do need to get out of the spiritual playpen and get on the battlefield for our Lord. And, uh, and the only way we're going to be able to do that is to study this book. The Word in you and you in the Word. The Word in you and you in the Word. We do have an adversary. The Bible warns us that we have an adversary that goeth about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Just because I'm saved, just because I'm born again, it does not mean that I will not have spiritual warfare. Now, last night we tried to lay a foundation that you would understand that a lot of us are in this building and we have problems we cannot solve. You have personal heartaches and personal sorrows and we have family and friends that are sick in body. Some of you are recently bereaved with loved ones you love. And how do we interpret Romans 8, 28? We talked about that last yes, night. Sir. All these things, huh? Yes. The good things and the bad things. Yes. God's working all of those. Amen. And uh, we have to understand that. We have to yes. appreciate what He's doing in our lives. Yes. And then we also have to have that confidence that when we cannot track him and figure out what he's doing, we can still trust him yes. that he's in charge. And so that's a confidence. But you only get that confidence when you spend time in the book. There's where the confidence comes. It's not an emotion. It, it, it's not, you know, it's not being able to say I can do this or that or a feeling because the closer we get to the coming of the Lord, there's not going to be so much an emotion or feeling as it is the fact of God's Word. And that's what I've got to have. I've got to have that truth. Now, having said that, we do have an adversary. We do have an enemy. We, that's the devil. And he does try to destroy. If you've never been saved, if you're here and you are religious, you have a religious activity in your life, you may even have religious ritual in your life, but that's not a relationship. And there's a difference in a relationship. We're not talking about lighting candles. We're not talking about being sprinkled or baptized. We're talking about a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. So if you've never been saved, then the devil doesn't want you to be saved. And so that adversary, he's going to do all that he can to block, to interfere, to keep you away from hearing truth or receiving truth or watching people rather than listening to the Word of God. The reason I keep talking about this book is because even in church, we have casualties of faith. People get their feelings hurt in the house of God. People get disappointed uh, in each other, even at the house of God. And uh, you brought it out at dinner tonight. Not every preacher agrees on every little thing. And, and I told them at dinner, sometimes I go preach and I don't agree with myself. And I get home and I say, did I say that? Uh, and, you, you know, because if you're up here long enough, you're going to put your foot in your mouth, you know. And, and yeah, that's, just, that's just a part of it. But grace and mercy covers that. God knows my heart. God knows your heart. God knows your heart. You wouldn't grieve the Holy Spirit and neither would you say anything against the Word of God. 
That's that trust. I trust God. I trust my brothers and sisters in the Lord. But sometimes the world puts more emphasis uh, in, in some uh, different parts of churches do and give more power and credence to the devil than we should. Uh, I, don't, I don't believe in that. And I'm not recommending you have a study on demons or the devil. You want to study something, you study the life of Christ. The more, you know, if you go up with us to Washington, D.C., and you go to the Department of Engraving, and uh, they teach those people to spot counterfeit. And uh, the shock that I had was they don't show them counterfeit money. They show them the real money. And they master the real money. And they so master the real money that when they see phony money, it jumps out. So you don't need to have a study on demonology or the, or the devil. You spend your time and your energy on studying God's Word and knowing the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't chase some rabbit down a trail because it'll take you away from knowing the Lord and knowing His Word. All right? But you need to understand that you're hearing a lot of teaching on television, radio, and people are bypassing the local churches, you and I know it, and they're bypassing the Word of God. And they're teaching prosperity, and they're teaching that you'll never be sick, and if you are sick, then there's sin in your life. And it causes a lot of heartache, causes a lot of confusion. And uh, sometimes you can hear, you know, somebody went out and their car wouldn't start, and they got out of the car, and they, they, they tried to start it, and it wouldn't start, it wouldn't start, and they got out. And they laid hands on the hood and they cast the demon out and to see if it'd start. But the problem wasn't a demon is the idiot left his headlights on all night. Uh, uh, there's a difference. Say, gonna get a witness on that one. I've been that idiot before. Say amen right there. Okay. So, so uh, that that's. Do you understand what I'm saying? Uh, God wants you to have good common sense. And he wants you to be balanced. There's two sides of the road of life. There's a left side. There's a right side. And if there's ever been an hour when God's people need to be balanced in the Word of God, and you need to be faithful in a local New Testament Bible-believing church, buddy, it's this day and hour. You don't need to lay out a church on Sunday night or Wednesday night. The Bible said if you really believe what you say you believe, and you see the dark cloud of judgment coming, and you believe the Lord could come at any moment, what did God say? He said, forsake not the assembling of yourself together. He said, this isn't the time to play hooky. He said, you go to church more, and that's what we need to do. So that's what I want you to help me do tonight. I want to talk to you about where did the devil come from because I believe it's important that you can balance because I want you to know exactly what the teachings of the Word of God are. So let's pray. Ask God to help us for just a moment or two. Heavenly Father, we come back into your presence asking for your help tonight, realizing our own weakness and our own humanity. We know tonight, Father, that we need your help more than ever. And so, God, I pray that you would touch us as only you can do. I pray you'd bring in the wanderings of our mind, the pressures of our day, and may we be able to have these few moments to study your word. And God will carefully give you all the glory. In the mighty name of Jesus, we ask, amen and amen. Well, let's think about it this way. Where did the devil come from? Sometimes I like to study by asking myself questions because I'm a very analytical person. And... So if you try to remember, when did you, was the first time you ever heard about the devil? And I, I went back thinking, well, when did I remember, have a conscious thought of hearing about the devil? And it went all the way back to my childhood. I remember hearing about that. And, and then I thought about the things that our society plants in our heads about the devil. I thought about, even as a child, the comic books and the cartoon characters on TV and uh, they had a devil, or they would put devil horns on, uh, on some cartoon character when they misbehaved. Yeah. 
uh, Donald Duck was always getting a set of horns because he was always misbehaving. And so uh, we have that conscious thought. And then uh, comedians started talking about the devil more and more. And then you had some comedians saying that the devil made me do it. And uh, they blamed the devil for their conduct. And, and some of you uh, know that parents and uh, Sunday school teachers and vacation Bible school teachers, uh, they spoke about the devil, that there was a, a, a devil personality. And some of you remember hearing about the devil uh, from your sweet little grandmother, remember? Because she looked over at Brother Roy and said, now that one's a devil. And uh, so uh, I, I remember that. <laughs> and he was going to get an amen. <laughs> uh, so is there a real physical devil? And uh, if so, where did he come from? And how did he get into our world? Well, let's go to the Word of God. All these answers are found in the Bible. And we'll never understand our world, the purpose of our lives, without a biblical world view. You've got to look through the Word of God. You can't look through CNN or Fox eyes or the New York Times eyes and understand this world. You've got to look through the Word of God. Now, pastors and preachers, evangelists and missionaries, if we understand our assignment, if we understand our responsibility as men of God, our very best day as a preacher is when we go to the pulpit and we're nothing more than a window for someone to look through and see the Lord Jesus Christ. They don't go to see a man, they don't go to see a personality, but they go look through you and see Jesus. And the only way that we can do that is to be a student of the book. That, that would be in our lives. Now in Genesis 1.1, uh, look with me, it says, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, and God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness, and God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning was the first day. So God established a heaven, and God established an earth. Now we know that God, uh, before God created the heaven and the earth, that there was God in the dateless past. So uh, we know before there was a physical planet earth, there was still a God. And we don't know what else was in creation at that time. But we do know that God was there. Now this verse serves as an instruction into the Bible. And the book of Genesis is foundational. It's important to know the book and, and to know that uh, one of the things you find out in hermeneutics is obviously is that God's not going to contradict himself. If God tells Amen. its truth in Genesis, it's still going to be truth in the book of Revelation. Amen. And so we've got the truth of God is the creator. Now, I do a prophetic series called 1948. And in 1948, we're working backwards on this subject, when did the end begin? I don't know when Jesus is going to come back, right? God said not even the angels know that. So no man knows the day or the hour. But how many millions of dollars have been spent on signs, billboards, TV programs, people predicting that a certain date was going to be the return of the Lord? Do you remember the uh, message and all the, the uh, activity around 88 reasons why God was going to send Jesus back in 1988? And I saw that book on sale the other day. Uh, at a used bookstore. It was 25 cents. Uh, 88 reasons why Jesus is coming back in 1988. Well, let me tell you something. The guy that wrote that book is brilliant. He's an astrophysicist, and he is, he's brilliant. But he made a fatal flaw. He did all of his feast calculations. He did all of his day calculations. He did all of the Julian calendars and the Roman calendars. And, he, and that was brilliant stuff. But he made a mistake. 
The Bible said, no man knows the day or the hour. And you're not going to get around that. And if you write a book about it, God's going to embarrass your britches off. Say amen right there. So that's exactly what happened. He got embarrassed. And, and then we've had others. Uh, uh, what was his name? Campin uh, was the latest one. And uh, he was going across the country. And so he said the last big one. And you know where they found him on the day? He was on a tour to Turkey sightseeing. Uh, when the day, he didn't even think the Lord was coming back. But he had made millions of dollars off the deal. So uh, if, if you hear some guy on the radio, the TV, and he's saying, I've got it figured out, I know the day, change the channel. That's right. Save your time. Because he's a false prophet. The Bible has documented this. But I can go through this passage and know that we do have truth from the Word of God. And what does he say? In the beginning, God created. So if God created this earth and he created the, the beginning of time when time started, then uh, I can go to Matthew 24, verse number 8. All these are the beginning of the end. So I can look at one end of this creation and then I can start looking towards the other end. And in Matthew 24, he lists all those things that we're going to see happening at the last days that expose the office work of the one we're talking about tonight, Lucifer the devil. Now, uh, so if I don't know the date, then can I work my way backward in prophecy and say, well, this is when it started counting down to the end. And, and so 1948, we started out on that journey. And because you work backwards, what happened in 1948? What was the big one? May 14th. Israel becomes a nation. So God started the clock. He reached down and it started ticking again. So now everything else comes in line with that. 1948, then we have the invention of the microchip. 1948, magnetic tape is, is invented so we can record data. 1948, TV went on in the United States. And that was the beginning of communicating with a whole country and eventually the world. First man-made satellite, 1948, the Defense Department, communication. All of that comes online. But then everything else, 1948. We started killing babies in America, 1948. The National Council of Churches, 1948. Do you see what I'm talking about? All of this ties together. The World Bank, 1948. United Nations, 1948. Uh, Pakistan comes out of India, 1948. North Korea, out of South Korea, uh, 1948. North Vietnam, South Vietnam, 1948. Now you're seeing the nations and the, the, uh, what we talk about in Matthew 24, the principalities and the powers, yeah. all of that coming together. And it's building and it's building. But 1948, we had something else big happen. We had the actual teaching that creation was not the answer, and they called it the Big Bang Theory. Matter of fact, there's a popular uh, comedy show that plays off of that, making fun of anything moral, spiritual, or anything to do with the Bible that would be the Word of God. And the Big Bang Theory was that uh, there was an explosion, and it all started. Where did that begin? 1948. If we're going to get ready for an antichrist, we've got to re-educate the generations that follow that they will not believe the Bible's the word of God and that the Bible will be undermined. And so all of this was the office work of your adversary, the enemy, the wicked one, the devil, the deceiver. And so, church, we've got to be more more educated than we've ever been about the things of God. We've got to know the real so we're not tricked by the false. Amen. And the only way that we can do that is for God to continue to deal with us. Now, uh, let me go to the book of Job. Turn with me to Job chapter 38. Job chapter 38. And uh, let me give you another verse or two to think about. In Job chapter 38, we know that God created the heavens and we know that he created the earth. 
But now I want to focus on the earth for the next few verses, okay? Uh, God's having a conversation with Job. If you have one of my study Bibles, those old sword Bibles, uh, it's the Bible that has the words of God in red. Now, in the New Testament, we have the words of Jesus. But if you've got one of those old Bibles, study Bibles, the words of God are in red. And when you get to Job 38, verse 2, it all changes to red. So verse 2, verse 3, verse 4 is out of the mouth of God. Now, he's talking to Job, verse 4. Where wast thou when I laid the foundation of the earth? Question mark. Then who hath laid the measures thereof in verse 5? Or who can stretch the line upon it? Question mark. Verse 6. Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened? In other words, what's holding the earth up there? What, what did I hang it on, Job? And then my, my key verse for your study tonight is verse 7. Because that's the pivotal verse. Now remember, all, go all the way to verse 41. It's all in red. It's all out of God's mouth. Chapter 39's in red. It's out of God's mouth. But look what God said in verse 7. When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Now what was he talking about in verse 4, verse 5, verse 6? And up to verse 7, he's talking about the creation. He's talking about the earth being created. Job, where were you when I hung all of this in outer space? And he said in verse number 7, look how he phrased it. He said, Job, when I laid the foundation of the earth, the stars rejoiced. Now listen to me. God not only created the stars, but he named them all. They've got a name. Now, you don't think you've got a great God. I hate people try to put this big God in a little basket. He will not fit. He's a great God with mighty power and great authority. And he's big enough to create. Go outside tonight. Go out in the backyard. Look up there. He not only made them, he named them. He named them all. And, and, and he called them by personal name. And he said, when they watch me make the earth, he said, these stars that I created, yeah. they rejoiced yeah. <laughs> at my might and my power. Yeah. Yeah. And what are they doing with these giant electron yeah. telescopes? They yeah. now have discovered, man in his great wisdom, that every star has its own voice, yeah. that it makes its own sound, yeah. that it's got its own musical note. And that they can turn the big satellites and every one of them, they can not only identify with location and GPS of the heavens, but they each have a different sound wave coming in, electronic sound wave. What did God say in Job 38? He said the stars rejoiced and they sang and he said even, even the angels sang. They rejoiced as they witness the power of my creation. Now, that sounds to me like that God had a plan for planet Earth. It doesn't say anywhere else in the Bible that when he made Mars, they rejoiced and they shouted. Glory to God, I could throw a truck. Hey, it doesn't say anything about when he created Mercury that they rejoiced and they shouted. But when he created the Earth where man was going to be and his sweet darling son was going to walk on this piece of dirt. He said the angels rejoiced and they sang praises and the heavens rejoiced with the glory because God had a plan. Lord, and you're wondering how you're going to make it through the week and God's got all this glued together. I promise you. Now, this is how we know that God has worked in the past and God will work now. You can read and study more about the dateless past if that interests you. And one of the places you can go is to the book of Proverbs uh, chapter number 8. And in Proverbs chapter number 8 in verse number 22, the Lord possessed me in the beginning of his ways. Now what is God talking about there? He's talking about wisdom. He's talking about wisdom. He's saying 
that this is wisdom being described in the 8th chapter of the book of Proverbs. And he said, The Lord possessed me in the beginning of his way. And then the next part of that says, Before his works of what? Of old. In other words, God had a plan, God had a purpose, and God was working those works of old. Wisdom of God was before angels. The wisdom of God was before men. The wisdom of God was before the earth was created. And God said, from everlasting to everlasting, from the beginning, before there ever was time, there was the wisdom of God. There was the plan of God. God didn't need me. God didn't need this earth. God didn't need an angel. God was all sufficient. He was three times holy. He was holy in the morning. He was holy at lunch. He was holy at the midnight hour. He was holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. He did not need men. He did not need angels. He was totally self-sufficient. And wisdom was described in the book of Job and the book of Proverbs as this great God with his power. He said before, from everlasting to everlasting, that's that dateless past. If you got a piece of paper there, I'll give you some verses you can look up when you get home on this dateless past. You can go to John 1.1. That's one of my favorite ones. Uh, In the beginning was the Word... And the Word was what? Was with God. Well, who was this Word? (laughs) The Word was with Him. And and when Jesus walked on this earth, you know, that's why I got so blessed down at Qumran. What if that's the place that Jesus went in those mystery days from the time that we see Him disappear uh, to His revelation at age 30 Could it be he went down with his cousin John and he hung around down there? And could it be in one of those caves? He's sitting there and he's writing out Isaiah. He's making sure. Because when they got the Dead Sea Scroll of Isaiah and they unrolled it and they translated it, it's absolutely verbatim exactly as your Bible is in the King James translation. It is the Word of God preserved. Could it be that Jesus, the Word, was sitting there writing down the Word at Qumran? I I don't know, but I like to think about that because the Bible says the dateless past. In the beginning was the Word. Acts chapter 15, verse 18. Ephesians chapter 3 and verse number 9. That is dealing with the dateless past. And you go to Colossians chapter 1. Verse number 18, Hebrews chapter 1 and verse number 10. And then you can go back to Hebrews chapter 11 and verse number 3. And then to 1 John chapter 1 and verse number 1. And then you can go over to the book of Revelation chapter 1 and verse number 8. And then Revelation chapter 3 verses 1, 2, 3, and 4. All of those deal with a dateless past. The book of Revelation, God's Son Jesus said, The Amen. Amen. The beginning of the creation of God. And so if I look at those scriptures and realize I've got the heavens, I've got the earth, and then I've got the Word that's there the whole time, the wisdom of God. And God didn't want me to walk on this earth without the wisdom of God. And that I would understand that there's an adversary but the way for me to make it through here is to know this book. Now, here comes the hard part. In heaven, God created a very special angel. And that special angel was named Lucifer. Now, here's what I want to point out. There's never been a created being like Lucifer. And we don't have time to go through all this, but you can go to Ezekiel chapter 28, and there's a, there's a key verse there, verse number 12, Ezekiel 28 and 12. It talks about, uh, thou seest, sealest up the sum. And then, what did we say this great attribute of God was in the book of Job? It was wisdom, 
And what does he say about Lucifer? He's full of wisdom. Ezekiel 28. And he talks about in verse number 12. And then he says, he said he's perfect in beauty. There's never been a creation like this. So Lucifer was perfect in beauty. And this cannot be said of a fallen man. So that's how I know that, uh, you know, this passage is talking about the king of Tyrus. But we all know that have studied the book that we have an earthly king of Tyre. And uh, that was Ithobamus II. And uh, that was the earthly king. But we know that God wrote about the supernatural king, and that's Lucifer. And so some of these scriptures, when you go in here, that there's no earthly man going to be perfect in his beauty. So that's how we know he's talking about the supernatural king. Now, look at verse 17. Uh, we know that thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. Now, I'm reading Ezekiel 28, 17. This is a very, very important verse. Thine heart, whose heart? Lucifer's heart, was lifted up because of his beauty. And God said, thou hast corrupted thy what? Thy wisdom. And why did he corrupt it? By reason of thy brightness. In other words, God said, Son, I, I gave you all this uh, talent. I gave you all this ability. gave you all this wisdom. But your pride has corrupted and caused you to sin with all that I've given you. Okay? And so we know that. Uh, we know that no earthly man had these talents. Now, in the Hebrew, in the Hebrew, that word brightness, if you read it in the Hebrew uh, text, it would say that that word brightness is splendor. In other words, God was talking about the splendor that he gave Lucifer and the great kingdom that he gave him. He gave him uh, multitudes of angels to rule over and his job was to bring glory and honor and praise to the Lord God Almighty. Now, uh, let me give you three things about that splendor. That will help you understand it. Number one, that's the splendor of Lucifer's kingdom. The splendor of Lucifer's kingdom. He had power and position under God Almighty. Number two, in 1 Timothy 3, 6, we read about the power of pride. 1 Timothy 3, 6. Not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride he fall into the condemnation of the devil. So there's that warning of pride. Number three, we've got to talk about Lucifer's kingdom. We talk about Lucifer's pride. I'm going to hit the high places, but we've got to talk about Lucifer's authority. Lucifer stood over angels and men, and notice what's going to happen here. As he stood over angels and men, he's going to be one day bound and humbled and you note this, that earthly king was bowed and humbled of Tyre. And God said, as he was, I'm going to do the same thing to Lucifer. That same pride he had as an earthly man, Lucifer's got it a billion times worse as a supernatural being. And he said, but I'm going to bind him and I'm going to bow him. That's what's going to happen. All right. Now, in your notes, you can write this down. Number one, Lucifer was created by God. Number two, Lucifer looked different than any other angel. That's the second attribute you've got to pay attention to. And number three, Lucifer sounded different than any other angel. He looked different. He sounded different than any other angel. Now, what is the most powerful form of of communication. The Amish know what the most powerful form of communication is. If you go to Amish country, they have a theater that illustrates biblical stories. Does anyone remember the name of their theater? 
Exactly right. Sight and sound. And you know what God put inside of Lucifer? An unusual sight and an unusual sound. Now, did we just not read that Lucifer had wisdom? Great wisdom? If I'm going to destroy a generation and make them worship the devil and rebel against God and deny the existence of God, then would I not be able to use the element of sight and sound to re-educate them? Huh? Have you ever heard of MTV? Have you ever heard of VH1? Have you ever heard of BET? All those are three channels that are built on sight and sound. In the hotel of the Amman Jordan, MTV. Hotel in Jerusalem, MTV. Hotel in London, MTV. Hotel in Seoul, MTV. Hotel in Sydney, Australia, MTV. When those pastors were broken in South Korea and they were weeping in that altar at 4.30 in the morning and they would come back at 5 o'clock, 3 and 4,000, and at 6 o'clock, 5 and 6,000. And I said, why are you so burdened? He said, because America has turned its back on God. Instead of sending us God, you're sending us a music from Los Angeles called K-pop. That's what they told me. They told me. They said, you're importing sight and sound that's taking our children away from the God we love and serve. You see, you don't realize, but that plays over and over and over. And it's repetition. And that's God's way to learn. Line upon line, line upon line, precept upon precept, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little. That's why we have Sunday school. Yeah. That's why we have church. Yeah. We don't have Sunday school because we're bored as preachers and we don't have anything to do. Yeah. We're trying to keep your children out of a devil's hell. Amen. Yeah, brother. We're Amen. trying to put the word in there. Yes. That's why we have training union on Sunday night. It's yeah. not that we don't have anything to do. We can watch golf another hour, yeah. right? Yeah. We can watch another race. Yeah. But we know if we just got about 45 minutes, if we can get some gospel yeah. in your babies, yeah. Yeah. maybe they can stand against the attack of hell yeah. that's coming on them. Amen. So we have Sunday morning, Sunday night, training union Sunday night. We, we put all this together, line upon line, line upon line, precept on precept. What about Wednesday night? Here a little. Amen. What about special service Thursday night? There a little. Yeah. Camp meeting, tent meeting, revival meetings. All of those are so that you can get more of the Word in yeah. you Amen. because of the day and hour that we're living in. Does that make any sense at all? So, uh, you know, we can sit on a pew and we can fuss and, and be mad at each other and the devil says, why don't you just do that? Won't you be mad at that family, not speak to them? You don't speak to those people. You get mad at another preacher across town. Y'all keep that up because I'm taking the babies out of your church and I'm damning their souls. Last year, last year, the church passed the world in divorce rate. The world had 49% of the population, but those that attended church, 51%. You've got an adversary. We can't just sit on the pew and say, well, I, I served my time in the nursery. I visited all I can visit. I, I, I sang in the choir 20 years. I'm telling you, you sing in that choir till they roll you out dead. <laughs> I'm telling you, you go visiting until they find you in somebody's front yard. We Listen, this isn't the time to quit. This is not the time to retreat. This is not the time to back up. This is not the time to give in. This is not the time to give out. This is the time to refire, reload, and charge hell for the souls of our children and our grandchildren. We need revival for this generation. Now, I was going to teach. I wasn't going to do that. Now, listen, I can't help it. We're in trouble. All right, look at this. 
that sight and sound is powerful. Yeah. And, and here's how powerful it is. Notice verse number 13 there in Ezekiel 28. Notice his looks. Yeah. He's covered with every precious stone. Yeah. We've got this, the sardis stone, the topaz, the diamond, the barrel, the onyx, the jasper, the list goes on. God created an angel, and instead of putting angel skin on him, whatever that is, God put on him a covering. And Brother Roy, I was working on this, and I was thinking, God put all those stones on his chest. But there had to be a reason, right? Why would God do that? Why did God hang stones on the breastplate of the high priest? That's right. yeah. uh-huh. yeah. That there'd be glory and honor in his presence. Yeah. You see, we have on earth a miniature of what's in heaven. Yes, sir. And the original plan of God was that he would be praised by this angel of great design and plan yeah. and the glory and honor be to him. And that's now under the curse. So now we've got a man in the wilderness and a man in the temple and he's got stones on him and he's going in to take the blood and put on the mercy seat and he's bringing glory and honor to the Lord God Almighty. But it wasn't intended that way. Now, Now notice this. I've got a great angelic being. He's covered in glory and power. He's perfect in his beauty. He's got great authority. He's got all these stones on him. And uh, he's displaying that power. He's displaying his might. He's displaying this great wealth. All of that is a light show and a picture that you can only imagine. And then in the middle of all that, God said, by the way, I put tablets and pipes in you. No other creation on planet earth has tablets and pipes. Do you know what that meant? Do you understand that? That's music. That is the music video. You've got the light show and the music all together. No wonder the devil is trying to reach a whole generation by combining music and sound. And no wonder... We're seeing the churches fall into the trap of the devil and turn the house of God into a light show and try to substitute the Holy Spirit by some smoke and mirrors and having some lights and some rock music and think that will be the Holy Ghost for this generation. Do you see how that's working? That's not what God had planned. Everything is to bring glory and honor to the Lord God Almighty. Now, watch this. This is very important. From what I can do and research in the Word of God and the old writers, uh, the best I can put together, and I, you know me, I'm not a, a, a proud fellow. If, you, if I make, something, uh, make a wrong statement, I'm not too proud to say it that I messed up there and I'll clean that up. But the best I can put together, the best I can figure out, and the best from the old writers and all the research I can do, it works something like this. That God created the heavens and the earth and the angels rejoiced and the stars sang for joy. And then when that happened, God in heaven had all the angelic beings and God had already created Lucifer and he brought him in. Now, if I understand this by reading it, here is the throne of God, okay? This is holy, 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 holy Lord God Almighty. This is so holy that if I looked upon him, I would explode with his holiness. I've got to have a new body to be able to do that. And in front of him, apparently, is the symbol of his holiness, the burning fire and stones that are there so that nothing goes to him unless it's purified by the fire of his holiness. Every word that comes out in praise goes through that. 
to make sure there's no vanity in it or no self-pride in it. It goes through that to go to the ears of a holy God. That when God's son Jesus died on the cross, that even the cries from the cross had to pass through this to go to the ear of a holy God. And Lucifer's job was to bring all the heavenly creation. Remember, all the angels are created by God, right? And so they're created and they come in and they are worshiping God. And when the, what do they do? They begin to praise God and they begin to sing. And, and we don't know exactly what that was made up of, but we know that the musical instruments are in Lucifer. So when he began to cause them to sing, or uh, they began to praise God, that apparently when he raised his big wings and was uh, leading them and praising, then as the praises began to come, they would begin to come against that special body that he made. And when he breathed out, he would breathe out musical tones and praises to a holy God, yeah. tabrets and yeah. pipes. Yeah. And then when the praise began to be uh, loud and, and spontaneous from those angels, yeah. he would begin to walk back and forth yeah. in front of the throne of a holy God. Yeah. And he would praise him as Jehovah God. He would yeah. praise him as El Shaddai. Yeah. He would praise him as he's God Almighty. Yeah. And then notice what would happen when he began to praise him with his voice and all that sound and praise come, then with the height and energy of all that worship, he would step off into that holiness. That was the only, like the high priest couldn't go in without the blood. Lucifer couldn't go in without the praise to a holy God. And he would walk in those stones, the flaming stones, and there he would bring glory and honor to a holy God. In a holy scene we can only imagine. In a holy scene that's not recorded. Because this one with the tablets and the pipes, he's Lucifer. And Ezekiel 28, 15 says, Thou was perfect in thy ways from the day that thou was created till, till, Iniquity was found in thee. And what does Colossians 1.16 say? Whether, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. Amen. Lucifer lost his yeah. position. Yeah. But Lucifer didn't get stupid when he came to earth. Yeah. You still have an adversary. Yes, I can't fight him in my strength. I've got to have the blood of Amen. Jesus Christ. Amen. Now you say, Brother Ralph, why is that important? Because of this. If Lucifer can fall, if he can see all that, if he can have all this position with the stones on him, what about me? I, I'm telling you, I've got to stay close to the Lord. You've got to stay close to the Lord. I've got to read my Bible, and I've got to pray. You know what Lucifer said? He said, I don't want to be God. He said, but you could honor me. Just put my little throne a little bit higher than God's. Do you know what Lucifer was doing? He was taking a selfie. Yes, brother. Yeah, go ahead. Now, wait a minute. You got to connect our society to intoxicated on selfies. I, I, I don't want to be you, God, but let me get my throne up here just a little high. You starting to connect the dots? I was sitting at Wendy's the other night eating supper after I'd been preaching. And there's a guy in front of me ordering, and he's listening to his tunes, and, and, and he's sitting there in the car. <laughs> and he got his drink, he went. <laughs> and he got his cheeseburger. <laughs> and then I hit my horn. No, wait a minute. I, but, 
but I, we're all intoxicated with this. But we don't know where it came from. It's not about me. It's about Him. You want to change your marriage? You put God first and then you start loving your wife as yourself. You want to change that home? You start loving your husband like you love yourself. Put God first. Start loving your children with a new love. And you're going to see revival break out. Start loving this church. You say, well, you don't know the problems in our church. Yeah, I do. You're a member there. Uh, So, what what we've got to understand, it's not about us. No, it ain't. It's all about Him. If we had time, i got to get you out of here, but if we had time, what are we going to do with that scripture in Genesis where it says that Lucifer was in the garden? The Bible says he was in the garden of God. You say, well, wasn't that the serpent? Well, I do this to Trinity, so don't... don't I like to just put stuff out there to think about... So, if it was the serpent, how, what happened to all those stones yeah. and those big wings? Yeah. And if he talked, you'd hear the tabrets and the pipes. Yeah. And this is what I've been thinking about lately. Yeah. Maybe the serpent was the most beautiful animal yeah, God right. created. Maybe there was nothing in the garden like the serpent. And Lucifer said, you're the prettiest one in the whole garden. You're the greatest one. I mean, is it not possible maybe that animals communicated before the fall? We don't know what all fell when it fell. Could it be that Lucifer was talking to the serpent? Because the serpent is talking to Eve before the fall. Huh? And could it be that Lucifer appealed to the pride of the most beautiful animal in the garden? Huh? And then we begin to see the danger of that. Because I, just a man, you're just a man or a woman, and we need the Lord like we've never needed Him before. This whole world's intoxicated on selfies. That's right. We watched our president at a funeral. Yeah. Remember that? Yeah. He pulled out his phone, started taking pictures of him and some prince. Yeah. Remember that? Uh-huh. Some princess. Yeah. yeah. That went over good until he got home. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> then that didn't go over too good. Do you, do you understand? Yes. It, it's an intoxication of this generation. But let's go back to the root source. Let's look through today's world through our biblical worldview. You say, well, well, then what do we take home? We take home that there's none righteous, no, not one. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And that I need revival even after salvation. I've got to stay without spot and without wrinkle because I am of that same flesh. And we need to be broken before the Lord. Let's bow our heads and pray, shall we? Let me ask you a question. The altars were filled last night, but I, I want to make a different invitation tonight. I want to ask you something. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed, who would say tonight, Brother Ralph, uh, I know I'm saved. I really believe that. But I'm not where I need to be. I, I, need, I need God to just give me some fresh anointing. I'm exhausted mentally and spiritually. I need fresh oil. Just slip your hand up. God bless you, ma'am. Oh, my, a multitude of hands. All right. Uh, now I ask one more question. You can put your hand down. Is there anyone here that say, Brother Ralph, I'm not saved. I'm not sure I'm saved. Pray for me. You're not sure you're saved. Okay. My message tonight was to the church, right? That's my burden, for the church to have revival. You raised your hand. One last question, question number three. How many would say, Brother Ralph, I do see the need tonight for revival. I realize that we do have an adversary, the devil, and I want God to give me my tears and my burden back for this hour that we're living in. Would you slip your hand up with mine as a common prayer? Father, you see our hands and you know our hearts. 
we ask you tonight to do for us what we are unable to do for ourselves. We ask you, God, to revive us again. I pray, God, you'd give us a fresh love affair for the Bible, your Word. God, that we'll have the Word in us and us in the Word. And then, God, that we'll have a fresh burden and compassion for our own family. That we won't quit praying for one that's hard to pray for. Or one that gets on our nerves. That we'll, we'll pray for them again. And, God, for us that have a a son or a daughter or a grandchild out in the world, that we wouldn't give up on them. Then God would begin to pray to put a hedge around our children and a hedge around our grandchildren, knowing what they're facing in this world. And then, God, would we pray for our local churches and, God, that each church would pray for its pastor. Then we'd pray together for revival for this day and hour. God, you do for us what we're unable to do for ourselves. And God, will leave this building rejoicing and thanking you for your divine and holy presence. In Jesus' mighty name. And all God's people said, Amen. amen. You still love me? Say amen. amen. If you don't, I'm going home with you. Need all your chicken. <laughs> now listen, Pastor Roy went over with me today and I want to make sure I say this correctly, New Life. New Life Baptist Church, the old Gateway Baptist Church property. We went over there this afternoon, and I didn't know this. I thought the church was just there on the hill, and that was it. But there's 190 acres back behind that church. Beautiful valley, great views, and... That church family has offered that to us for a tent meeting this fall. If we want to come in there and put the tent up. Amen. And we're thinking about the Labor Day Monday. You know, everybody be off work on that Labor Day, and we might start that Monday night, okay? Labor Day weekend. So Brother Roy is going to be uh, getting in touch with all you preachers. Uh, Brother Greg Lentz will be up here. He's at Pastor Danny Sykes, April 9 that week in Revival. And so I'll come over one of those days and we'll go to lunch. And we'll talk about it, see if it's practical, see if everybody can work it out. And then we'll make it official. But that way we can be praying and working to that end. And what a time to have a revival Right before the election, yeah. our churches Amen. in tr crisis, Amen. our schools in crisis, yes. our country in crisis. Yes. That'd be a great time yes. for God's people to pray and fast yes. and to beg God to send revival. Yes. So I hope you'll do that. If you're not our friend on Facebook, please go to Ralph Sexton Ministries and be our friend on Facebook. And uh, you mentioned the garden series just a minute ago when we were shaking hands. And we're working on another one or two over the next, uh, this week and next week on the gospel from the garden. And then we've got some things from Israel we're hoping to, to put together for you. Now be here Thursday night uh, if you can and come praying, come believing. We'll try to tie all that together and uh, be faithful to your church tomorrow night. If, if you want to uh, get a little break, Send your pastor with me to the Holy Land, right? And Brother Roy's got that information. That's November the 8th. We got the prayer cards back there. This is our latest research on ISIS uh, that's evil to the fourth power. Uh, Revelation talks about that there's four demons being restrained underwater in the Euphrates River Valley. And I was picking pastor's brain at supper about Daniel dealt with a demonic force out of that same, you know, river valley there in Persia in, in the book of Daniel. And so uh, isn't it interesting? Could it be that ISIS is the John the Baptist for the Antichrist, preparing the way for the great tribulation? I've got a picture in there of the ISIS leader with, on his horse with his flag and he's saying, we need one man to lead us all to a world caliphate. 
And then we've got the message we just did at the Jubilee in Gatlinburg on grace. Don't you go home bite your fingernails. God's got grace for every day. Feel the trumpet sound. And we went to church that night. Say amen right there. Amen. So uh, that's, that's there. Pastor, you come and close. And don't forget uh, April the 8th. Uh, we're going to be having that youth thing in Asheville. And then I'm going to be talking to you. Uh, on Saturday, we're going to have a special uh, drama where we act out the Bible. And uh, if you've not gotten that information, it's back there at the table. And then our latest research on marriage marriage makers and marriage breakers. And that's why I'm going home Friday night, say amen right there, because I don't want to get in trouble, and I slap dab forgot. And uh, it's uh, my uh, granddaughter-in-law, uh, Winston's wife, hers is the 18th, and Winston's is the 19th, and they'd planned a shindig, and I was going to be over here with my buddy rolling. <laughs> Permanently. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you're going because I don't want you to stay. <laughs> Been two good nights, hasn't it? Amen. Listen, go back to your church to, tomorrow night. And uh, those, uh, hey, Oakland people, be here tomorrow night. We've got a great Bible study tomorrow night. Boy, I tell you, just imagine if we get a hold He's always present with us. As he was with Joseph, I'll be what? With you. Three times he says, as I was with Joseph, I'll be with you. And just think who's with you. And uh, what a study that God's given us for tomorrow night. And we'll be back Thursday night. And, and let's really pray and uh, trust the Lord. And, uh, and uh, it's, it's a wonderful time to serve him. Amen. 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 Let's stand to our feet tonight. How many ever raised your hands in church? Amen. Hallelujah. hallelujah. Now hold them up. Amen. I'm going to count to three. We're going to say glory, hallelujah, amen. One, two, three. Glory. Glory. Hallelujah. hallelujah. Amen. amen. Good night and God bless you. Amen. Amen. amen.